may not know a lot about what's happening in the JVM. Uh, so I made a little analogy here, okay? It's an analogy. It's not exact, so shut up. Um, so ring zero, you know, in ring zero we have the core Java classes like Java Lang String, Java Socket, and all these other uh, classes. And so those are all trusted and they can all do whatever they want. There's no security restrictions on them. Uh, but we also we have uh, extensions. So if you look into your Java program files, Java um, extensions folder, you'll see things like QuickTime have privileged jar files in there, kind of scary. Um, so there's lots of people that have you know, privileged extensions. And again, those extensions can do whatever they want, no restrictions. But then there's also your code, which runs in user land, which typically doesn't have many permissions. Now, what's interesting is in, in Java, to instrument classes, you have to use an agent to do it. So an agent is an evil little, you know, Drew Rosenhaus, an evil little, you know, sports agent, right, think Jerry Maguire, that you drop into another process. And that guy, from that point forward, he acts on your behalf. So you have to write your agent in such a way that you can communicate with him, you know, from, from outside. So once we drop our little job agent in, not only does he have access to the, the classes in user land, which are your custom classes, but he also has access to classes um, like the Java classes, the trusted ones. So even if the code is signed, right, even if there's all kinds of Java security around, you know, in the framework, you got your policy files and all that stuff, um, Java Snoop will turn that off, um, essentially, and be able to use these, uh, use this agent to, to work with those classes. So we have access to all the classes. Um, so so that's, those are the two big parts of Java SNU, is the agent, the evil agent that does the, the instrumentation, and then there's the GUI that, that you know, talks to it. So even after learning about all this cool stuff and writing this program, we only have 12 hours left. Thursday is when you start sweating. So there's never enough time, but wish you had more. So, Let's talk about how Java Snoop could solve the problem of, of testing this applet. Okay, we're going to go through just very simply the, the life cycle of a typical Java Snoop test. Okay, so starting up Java Snoop is really easy. You just double click on a batch file or a bash file. So what that batch file does is it turns off Java security completely. Okay, turns it off completely. Turns it off completely. <laughs> so if you turn on Java Snoop and then browse to, you know, Samoy Kovu's you know website, you're going to get owned because there's no security anymore. Um, and there's so many people with Java O Day right now that their exploits don't even have to work if you're if you're you know going there with Java Snoop on, right? Because you're just going to get owned because there's no security. So no security. So we started up Java Snoop first. And then we started up our, our target program. This is an applet running inside a web browser. I haven't had to decompile anything. I haven't had to look at any protocols. I've had to do zero work. This is so easy a caveman can do it, because a caveman wrote it. <laughs> so the third step is to you know, go into Java Snoop and just pick any process. So I'm going to choose the process that the applet's running in, and I'm going to drop my agent into there. All that's invisible to you. You just double click on a process. Okay, how do I know which process to pick? Well, we give you a bunch of information about each process so it'll help you figure out which is one is yours, but you know, you'll be able to brute force this pretty easily. And applets, by the way, always have the same name, no matter what browser they're executing from. So the next thing to do is to pick a method. Right? So there's gonna be some manual work here, right? We can't you know, JavaScript can't figure out what's an important method in your application. So let's just, uh, let's just search for one. So we can see here a little screenshot of, of, of me searching for the word send in method names. So I have a bunch of results here, so I just picked the second one. So on the bottom, I have another piece of the, uh, the GUI highlighted here that asks you what you want to do with, the, with that function. So we have lots of options here. We can print the parameters to the console or to a file. We can run some custom Java. Okay, so you can just write in whatever Java you want and just have it executed when that function calls. Uh, you can tamper with the parameters. It doesn't have a return value, so we can't tamper with that. 
Or you can pause the program. If you have like a time of check, time of use vulnerability that you want to open up the window to, you can pause the program. So we're going to do something simple. We're just going to tamper with the parameters to this send function that looks like it takes a byte array. So once we choose that function, the Java Snoop GUI tells the agent that's inside the process that was automatically inserted, it says, hey, I want to intercept this method. And when, it's, when that method is hit, send me the parameters and give me the opportunity to tamper with it. All right, so again, I'm going to draw an analogy to the web. This is just like Fiddler or Burp or WebScare. Whenever you, you know, have intercept turned on, whenever that function gets called, you get a, a little pop-up box. That says, How do you want to mess with this data? So we do the same thing. So when that method gets called, you get a little pop-up. Gives you some information. It says, here's the class that's calling. Here's the method that's calling. This is something you wanted to edit. So here's your opportunity to edit it. So if you click on this nice little edit button, you'll get a screen that's uh, it's nice for editing byte arrays. Um, we have lots of different views, right? The view for editing a byte array is not going to be very useful for the view if you want to edit a Java list or a hash map or anything crazy like that. So we have all different kinds of views for all different types of objects, including custom Java objects. Right? So even if you have classes in your app that aren't serializable, I can still serialize them, and deserialize them, all that kind of stuff through some IBM library magic. So here's an example, uh, or he here's the byte array that I just intercepted. And uh, clearly, you can see it's not HTTP. It's some weirdo byte protocol. So I see one of those bytes has my user ID in it. So, and this is a chat message. Okay, so I'm sending some bytes to the server, and I'm providing my user ID to it. So this is a classic pattern of you can't trust the user, but the user is providing their own user ID. They're saying, I am this person. So I'm going to change that message. I'm going to change that byte so that it's the byte of my adversary. Alice is her name. So that worked. The chat message appeared as if it came from Alice. And we feel like we earned our money for the week because we found one serious flaw. So the next time a Java thick client comes around, I'm going to have this, this tool already built, and I'm going to be a lot faster. And that's what happened to get us here today. Uh, we had to build this, a very rough prototype of this tool in, I think we actually had two weeks. Um, for a client that was pretty much doing the exact same thing, um, except it was you know all financial stuff. So that's that's how we got here. Um, so I want to show you guys the tool uh, and do some stuff. If the demo gods fail me, uh, I will have some videos with some Fallout Boy background. Um, but let me let me tell you this first. Still, there's, this, there's still an open question here of how do I choose which method to hook, right? And by hook, I mean like which method do you want to intercept, basically. So the first answer to that is, well, maybe you can search for the method by name, right? You don't know what the method name is, but you know, send is a pretty good idea. You have a pretty good idea of what send is going to do. It's probably going to send something to the server. Uh, you can also search by return type, or if you just want to browse through the classes. For most applets, it's pretty easy to just walk through their classes and walk through their methods and um, just go through that, probably take a couple hours. But you'll have a good idea of their namespace and, and what cl different classes are doing. So the second way of finding out which methods you want to hook is my favorite part of this talk. So absolutely pay attention. Put down Twitter for like one second. So we, uh, we wrote this thing called canary mode. So the idea is that you don't know you know, let's say, let's say you have a form in your, in your Java application that you, you want to see how that data travels from, from that GUI to the server. So the idea is that let's put a canary value into that box. And then let's watch as that piece of data flows through the system. So you just, to start canary mode, you know, you go to the menu, start canary mode. And then you put your value into this box. This is going to be your unique value that should not be seen in any other part of the application. Right, so, so it's something unique to this very test you're about to perform. So you put in some, something unique there, and then you hit Start Canary Mode. So that disables all the other stuff you had going on with Java Snoop, 
and it enters this new mode. So now it'll look, it'll look at every single method in the JVM, Java methods, user land methods, whatever. And if a single parameter to that method takes a string, in our example, then it'll insert a little listener into that method. And that listener, if that listener detects that unique string that you put into the box, it'll send a little canary chirp back to Java Snoop. So I'll let that sink in for a minute. What, what's going to happen then at the end of the day is you're going to get all this data back about which methods your data went through. So we really created a very dirty, hacky way of doing data flow analysis through the application. So this slows things down a bit because we're instrumenting basically every method in the JVM. Um, but you know, the results on the screen show you what happens after your canary's been floating through, uh, through the classes. So the first place our function went, it, or our, our data went, was is trimmed empty, right? And at the end, it went to VW self public, whatever that method is. But what you what you found is all the methods that touch your data, right? And the last method in that list is probably the last place you have a chance to edit it before it goes off to the server. Okay. So answer number three, how would you know which methods to hook? Well, there's still always the hard ways of doing stuff. So you could decompile the code into an IDE, and you could look through it. Uh, maybe you could get some kind of static analysis tool to help you find something you might be interested in. I'm not 100% there's going to be any use at all um, in this particular case. But you know, there's no substitute for just looking through the code. Even if the code doesn't compile, having the decompiled code there to look through is always going to be helpful. So uh, I, think, I think I hit on this earlier, but so applets run obviously in a very, 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 very restricted place, um, way more restricted than user land. So the agent that we install into the application, it needs to do a lot of different things. It needs to be able to you know, redefine classes. It needs to be able to read uh, private fields with reflection. So it needs to do a lot of different stuff that you're not normally allowed to do. So this is why we turn off Java security. And I'm sorry about that. I wish there was another way to do it. But we have to turn off Java security. It's not like I took a shortcut. Uh, so I really can't stress that enough. You cannot browse anywhere else while you're running JavaScript. Talked about that. So something, uh, a very important point here, I, I, I did a I did a dry run of this talk at an OWASP uh, chapter meeting last week. And the guy was like, well, at the end of the talk, uh, I guess he wasn't listening. He said, I don't understand. You didn't show me any vulnerabilities on the server. You didn't prove any vulnerabilities on the server. So Java Snoop doesn't create new vulnerabilities. Okay? It just gives you a way, easier way to find and exploit the vulnerabilities that were there before, but that you had no idea were there. Okay, does that make sense? So we're not creating any O'Day with this thing. We're just finding and exploiting it. So it was maybe theoretical before, but hopefully now it's practical. Um, I've got this running on XP, Vista 7, uh, Mac now, and Linux. So if you use anything else, I hate you. <laughs> and I won't support you. Um, let's do a demo. Let's do a demo. So here is uh, here's my favorite radio station, or my favorite radio show, The Junkies in DC. They have a chat room on their uh, on their site. So I was given very explicit instructions not to do anything malicious here. So what we're going to do is I'm just going to prove to you that this stuff works. And if in case you're wondering, I did very well in my final uh, world. Oh, you can't see it. Why can't you see it? Oh, I know why. Hmm. 